everybody, my name is Rob Galvin. Thanks for joining us today on the DevTalk uh, webinar series. I really appreciate you, appreciate you coming on live. I know you're, you have a busy day, so always like to have a, a live audience. Um, just as a couple of quick reminders before we get into the topic of the day, um, if you missed the, some of the past presentations, they are available on Launchpad. The, the last three you can see on the screen, we did kind of an, an update uh, back in uh, September 21st on, on our SDKs, and then we had some interesting topics covering uh, printing in a web app and also best practices for MDK for Android uh, in the previous two. So definitely check those out. Those are uh, definitely good presentations to watch. The next presentation that we have, which is only a few weeks from now, is October 19th, and we're going to do a enterprise browser update. We have a release coming out, and we're going to share all the great um, features and updates that have been added to Enterprise Browser. So uh, be sure to tune in on October 19th on the next uh, Dev Talk. And just for kind of, I, we announced this um, last, last uh, presentation about our upcoming app forums for 2017. So we're definitely doing app forums uh, next year and we're in our early stages of planning them. But we do have some dates or some um, you know, months to consider if you're in North America, we will be holding an app forum in Las Vegas around the May timeframe. The dates have not been locked in yet. So uh, stay tuned for the exact dates that are coming up. And in Europe, uh, we're going to be holding it in Prague in June. So if you're in those areas, definitely um, plan on attending. It's going to be a really good app forum. We have some, some new um, topics and surprises for you. So stay tuned for some more updates over the next couple of weeks and months on uh, upcoming app form. But I wanted to give you guys a really early um, head start on thinking about attending. So today's presentation will be about Cordova. And if you're developing Cordova applications, we have uh, Darren Campbell who, who will be covering how to integrate Data Wedge into your, data, uh, into your Cordova application. And Robin West will be covering uh, printing. Uh, in your Cordova application. So uh, like always, if you can type in the questions as the presenters are talking, and we'll queue those up at the end. And um, so, yeah, I hope you enjoy the, the presentation today. Let me hand it over to Darren. Make you a presenter, Darren. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we see your screen, Darren. Okay. Go ahead. You see your screen. Brilliant. OK, so yeah, thanks very much, Rob, for that introduction. Uh, so what we're talking about is integrating Cordova applications with mobile, Zebra mobile computers. So at the moment we have, uh, if you go to developer.zebra.com, you'll see we have an EMDK for native development or for C Sharp development through Xamarin, or you can download Enterprise Browser, which gives you JavaScript-esque interfaces into our API but we don't have anything specifically for Cordova developers. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to just let you know about how you can add those data capture capabilities into your Cordova app. So um, I'm presuming that everyone on this call hopefully knows what Cordova is, but I'll just briefly cover, cover that and then want to give a little bit of background about what Data Wedge is, because that's probably less well known to, uh, to the the audience at large. And then we'll be doing a live demo, uh, probably wrap up in about 20, 30 minutes or so, just uh, with hopefully a, a fully functioning Cordova app that can capture some barcode data. So here we go. The Obviously, Cordova is a, an, un, an overlying framework, uh, an umbrella term, if you will. So on which other frameworks are based. So most famously, PhoneGap uh, has a lot of cloud services. Ionic is, looks, looks pretty, has Angular integration, Angular 2 integration with Ionic 2. And all of these are hybrid JavaScript development frameworks. So this is essentially just one slice of the whole ecosystem of application types that you can use if you're a JavaScript developer. So this was essentially what came first, but in the intervening years, we've seen most recently things like React Native come to the fore, Native Script, uh, Progressive Web Apps, just writing a mobile app and integrating with HTML5 
APIs to access the hardware. Um, on a, a lot of that is outside the scope of what I want to talk about. I'm presuming that if you're coming to this presentation, you've already gone through the analysis of which type of application is best for me, for my app, and whittled it down. And yes, I am writing a Cordova app. I need to somehow get that running on Zebra devices. Um, all of these Cordova-based frameworks have support for Cordova plugins. So whether that's the, the NG Cordova plugins, or Ionic Native plugins, or just the, the standard plugins, they're just uh, different shims onto the same plugin framework. I think NG Cordova is more Angular-based. I think Ionic Native is, is leaning that way as well, but for Angular, uh, for Ionic apps, and uh, there's no, there's no, uh, there's, there's a huge third-party uh, directory of these, whereas the actual number of curated uh, plugins by Apache are you know, very small. Uh, so we're going to be using third-party Cordova plugins to integrate with the DataWedge service on the device. So what's DataWedge? Now, DataWedge is running on every Zebra Android mobile computer. And it gives you the ability uh, to capture data with a zero-code solution. So without writing any code, I can configure the barcode scanner on my device, uh, or I could configure the MagStrike reader, the, the simul scan capabilities, and I could output any of that captured data through keystrokes, through Android Intents, or through uh, IP to some remote computer. And uh, how I do that capturing is encapsulated in a profile. So you have several data which profiles configured on your device. And the idea here is when you have a specific app that comes to the foreground, you then activate a specific profile. Um, so if I just go into the screen, this is just screenshots from data wages configuration. You can see here we're able to create this profile, obviously enable it, associate the apps, uh, and it's just a, a list of, of Android views where when you have this application in the foreground, then this data wedge profile will be enabled. Uh, the profile then has information on how we're going to do data capturing. So how do we in data? In this example, we're going to be using the barcode scanner on the device, so we want to enable the, the barcode scanner. And the, the configuration of that input, when you have when, when, when you have the barcode scanner, you, you're going to want to configure which decoders are enabled or disabled. Uh, most efficient scanning, you will disable all but the one or two decoders that you're going to want to use, uh, and maybe the parameters as, as well of those decoders, the maximum length of the barcode that you want to scan, or some kind of check digit logic to make sure that you've scanned an accurate barcode. But that's, that's all input configuration. Once DataWedge has captured that barcode, we then want to output that somehow. And this is where we get into the interface to the Cordova application that we'll write shortly. Uh, and we're going to be sending, this is just typical Android intents. So we've enabled the intent output. And you just have to give it an action. Um, so this, this action needs to correspond with the action we're listening to in the Cordova application. Uh, that's all configured on this device I've got beside me. Category will just leave blank, although you can specify the category. And then you can choose to have DataWedge deliver this intent to your application either via a start activity or a send broadcast. Now, obviously, if your application, if you're, if you're writing an application that has a broadcast receiver, then you're going to want to send the intent via send broadcast. But uh, for these particular third-party plugins I found, um, start activity is the method of conveyance that seems to work the best. Uh, so this is the architecture then of what we would recommend right now of a Cordova application should take that wants to interface with Zebra barcode hardware. So you've got data wedge in this kind of dirty yellow box portion at the bottom there, that's going to interface with our Cordova application through plugins, third-party plugins, these um, not from Zebra, and there's two uh, APIs here, there's the, the, the two directions, sorry, 
there's the instructions that are sent to Data Wedge from the app. So the app might want to initiate a scan uh, through software so that the laser comes out uh, all through software without having the uh, customer have to press the physical scan button on the device. And then coming back the other way, once the scan has been completed, you know, we've captured some scan data, we're going to want to, uh, to, to receive that in an intent. And we're going to be using one plugin for each direction of communication there. Uh, so on to the demonstration then. Prerequisites, just same as any Cordova application that you're creating. You need Node.js, you need Cordova. Cordova version minimum five, uh, I believe, for the, for the part that Robin's going to be covering next, although um, for this particular piece of the, of the demo, I think anything as far back as Cordova 3 would, would suffice. Uh, so I have here a, a live demo app, I call it. This is just an app that I created earlier on this afternoon. I didn't want to have to have everyone sit here whilst I you know, typed in Cordova Create, but it doesn't have anything special uh, in terms of platforms. Uh, if I just, these are the platforms present in the device. It just has Android. I've gone ahead and previously added the two third-party plugins that we'll be using. So we have this Web Intent and Intent plugin. These are just, I mean, how did I find these? I just went on Google and I typed in, you know, Cordova plugin, just like anyone on this call, uh, sorry, Cordova Intent plugin, just like anyone on this call would do. And uh, each of those had a, showing my, my browser on the screen right now, and, uh, you know, I just had a look at the capability to match what I wanted them to do. So this is the plugin to receive intents. It has a, an on new intent. Function of the intent coming from Data Wedge. So we'll do that next. Or into it. Um, again, we you can use whatever editor you like. I'm just using Visual Studio Code here. Uh, oh, have I have I got audio connection restored? It's just hopefully. Uh, it's going in and, and out a little bit, Darren. Uh, yeah, it's cutting up okay. a little bit. Okay, uh, is that better? I think maybe my machine was a bit strained from creating the Cordova app. Okay, now, yeah. okay, brilliant. Just you know, ping me if there's a problem, and um, I will try and fix it. Okay, so we just need to edit the Android manifest to add the intent filter. I have this copied off screen, so I apologize for the indentation here, but we're going to be listening for the com zebra data which called over dot action and this is the action that we've previously configured data wedge to send so if I just go ahead and run that on a device run Android now I've not gone ahead and modified any of the HTML or JavaScript code on my computer because I don't want to have everyone sit here whilst I edit code refresh do some kind of live update etc but uh, I'll what I'm going to do, just use Chrome Inspector, and hopefully this will just work rather nicely. So here we have the, the application, the Cordova app. Nothing special, it's just what you get out of the standard template. What the plugins uh, have exposed to us are, are, I can't remember offhand, so I'll just use this. So we now have an intent object and we have a web intent object. So I didn't choose these names, and if there was someone designing the plugin ecosystem for Cordova, they would have probably chosen some better names. But intent is how we listen for, for data wedge intents, and web intent is going to be how we send intents. So just going to the or It's a set new intent handler, and then we, we give it some function. So in the great, uh, here's one I made earlier. If we go to Chrome 
back to Chrome inspect by the intent handler here. So set new intent handler, this is all just using the plugin API, third party plugin API, and luckily or thankfully to the plugin developer, when the plugin receives this JSON object from uh, from Data Wedge, it actually parses it into a hash. So I'm able to get this extras hash, and this is the key that's coming from Data Wedge. This will be documented somewhere in the Data Wedge documentation, or I don't. I think I just said uh, the dot keys or whatever it is to see the available keys, and then chose the the one that looked most sensible. But you can see we're already at a stage now. If I press the physical scan button on my device, I'm able to read barcodes in uh, through my Cordova app. Um, Data Wedge is handling all of the scanning logic. It's sending an intent to my Cordova app. Cordova app is receiving that and just doing what it wants with it. Obviously, here we're just writing it out to the console. So that's going one way. That's reading data in. If we want to configure Data Wedge on the fly, there is an API available. And if we go to techdocs.zebra.com, the data wedge APIs here. I mean, you know, I guess I guess you would say uh, there are are all yet powerful API that data wedge exposes. So you have capabilities to the soft trigger, like I described earlier. You're able to disable scanning entirely. You can enumerate the available scanners on the device. Uh, a lot of our devices will have two. Uh, scanning interfaces, you might have a laser scanner, you might be able to use the camera scanner, you might have one of our wearable scanners associated via Bluetooth, so you could have up to three scanners connected, so you can enumerate them here. Um, and also, the way you change the configuration, the way you like set the decoders or unset the decoders, that's all handled via data wedge profiles, so you do need a, the ability to switch between profiles, but you can't configure the scanner any more granularly than that. I can't, through this Data Wedge Intent API, say enable code 128 as my decoder. That won't work. I need to have a specific profile configured in Data Wedge to switch between the two. Uh, 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 so, yeah, this is running and it has a broadcast receiver, so it's listening for broadcasts. And Web Intent plugin, uh, Web Intent Android plugin. I think this is quite well known. There seem to be a number of forks around. Uh, very common one on the Google search. But uh, yeah, it has obviously start activity, but we're going to be using send uh, com dot dummy broadcast. But uh, we from my notes, yeah, so send broadcast. The action is going to be a soft scan trigger, and we're going to call start scanning on that to belabor the point. Action trigger and start scanning. And you'll probably take my word for it here, but if I hold the device directly above the barcode, as soon as I enter this data, the, the laser comes out, and I'm able to, to read the, the barcode. So there, essentially, we have a zero, zero code solution in that we haven't written any native code. We've just used these third-party plugins to both control the scanner and receive some scan data back. Uh, just to show doing something a little bit more complicated, we might want to disable the barcode scanner. Let's say in a real app, you're, when you're scanning this barcode, you're going to be doing some processing on it. So you're probably maybe uploading it to a server and uh, it, you know, doing some price look up. I mean, you don't want the scanner to be enabled all of this time. You only want the scanner to be enabled when you're ready to receive uh, barcodes. And uh, through the scanner input plugin API, uh, we could just disable, disable barcode input. And if I've done that now, again, please take my word for it, I don't have a webcam connected, but I'm pressing the, the trigger and I'm not able to do any scanning. Um, the Obviously, I can undo that. If I enable, you don't have to just take my word for it anymore. You can see that it is now indeed scanning barcodes. So there we are, essentially a very quick end-to-end -end solution for reading barcodes, controlling the barcode scanner, all done in a matter of minutes.
is. So the benefits then, you could imagine this approach would work equally as well on uh, this, this, this app, sorry, is running on a Zebra device. It's running very well, uh, but I want my same app to also be deployed to uh, a Samsung tablet and use Zebra Crossing to do the scanning there. Uh, obviously, there's a Zebra Crossing plugin for Cordova, so you could just have all, all three third-party plugins in your app and then dynamically at runtime say, if I'm a Zebra device, then use Data Wedge, else if I'm a a Samsung device, then use Zebra Crossing to capture barcodes. That's not something uh, currently really supported with the Zebra native API, where you would, uh, unless you do something a little bit clever and out of the box, you would be required to create separate applications, one for your Zebra devices and one for your uh, non-Zebra, like Samsung or you know, other carrier devices. Uh, other benefits, uh, there are it's not just barcode capture, you could also capture the, the card data, MSR, MagStripe reader, and there is no native Java API available to capture that data. You need to use DataWedge, and this now provides the ability to capture that card data through a Cordova app. Uh, there's obviously some restrictions. Uh, if you're just writing a, a consumer app, then you might not have too many problems using third-party solutions, these, these, these third-party Cordova plugins. But if, if it's a, an enterprise app that you have to support for years to come, then you might have some second thoughts about, uh, about not controlling the whole system yourself. Bear in mind this is all available on Git, so you could fork it to your own company's Git repository, you could download it. It's, it's not like these things are going to disappear and you'll have no way to retrieve them, you could look at it on the flip side. Uh, it's, it's probably a good thing that you're able to see all of the code and, and if you have any bugs with it, you could modify these plugins, maybe submit issues back to the original developer as well. If you were going through Zebra and you had a maintenance contract, you then, you'd have to raise the support ticket, go through support, all that process, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It may be a little bit heavy handed for what you're trying to achieve. So yeah, maybe it's a, a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, the, oh yeah, uh, I've already covered the, the, the full control that you, you need to achieve that through data wedge profiles. Uh, that's one approach, using data wedge uh, with your Cordova application. Now there are other approaches. If you type in Zebra Cordova, then a couple of the top results in Google are likely to be plugins that other people have written. So the, the top one here, point number one, there was a company a couple of years ago that wrote a, a Cordova plugin that did something similar to what I've discussed on this presentation, but you will find it's a lot more tightly knit with itself. It, it's not as um, it's not as, as, as separate and I found it a little bit a little bit clunky. If if you if you want it to do what it wants to do, then it works very well, but it's not flexible in that it will always meld to your, you know, your company's way of, of creating your app. Um, but that's there, it's, it's released under Apache if you want to make use of it. There's also a, another plugin available, uh, written by myself actually, which enables access to the barcode hardware through our native API. So it's just a Cordova plugin uses the Enterprise Mobility Development Kit Java API to control the scanner and exposes a JavaScript interface on top of that. So if you were looking for that fine-grained control, maybe this is a better place for you to start from. Uh, not officially endorsed by Zebra, but it, it is there, it does work. I've written a little demo app. You can see it on the right-hand side, actually, uh, you know, you're able to control the symbologies and it will tell you the, the available scanners and you can enable and disable them. Um, the third option of course is um, you can always write your own plugin to maybe take what I've done in point two and build on that or take what this other company did under point one and, and build on that. Um, these are the other approaches uh, and it's when we talk about these other approaches that your feed is, is really critical here. So we're very conscious that Cordova is this huge 
uh, hugely popular development framework, and yet we don't really have anything specific that targets Cordova developers. And so if you're not happy, because you, you guys, you're the Cordova developers, you're the experts here, if you're not happy with the approach that I've covered with this data wedge approach, if you'd want us to, to create a traditional Cordova plugin, let us know. The more people we have asking for it, the more likely we are to go ahead and officially support uh, such a plugin. Alternatively, if uh, you, you see things moving more towards the native JavaScript native frameworks, let us know that as well. At the moment, again, there's no official React Native support for Zebra development. Um, just on a side note, if you go to the uh, my GitHub repositories, I did the other month put together a React Native shim so that you can download a, a React Native package from NPM and then uh, control Data Wedge from uh, your React Native app, it's kind of outside the bounds of this presentation, but you know th these these kind of things are out there, uh, and if enough people ask for them, then we will make that official. And all feedback, please, to developer.zebra.com. You guys obviously know about that because that's how you found out about this webinar. And with that, Just, I I will hand back either straight to Robin or to Rob. Yeah, so just we'll pause for a second, Darren. So just along the note of feedback, just so there's, um, it's all in one place, if you can kindly put the feedback right in the comments of this presentation. So in the developer events section of, of the um, developer.zebra.com, for this event, if you can just you know, add your comments there so we have it all in one place, uh, that would be appreciated. So I just, I just want to... Um, uh, just mention a few things because I know there was a couple people confused in the beginning. So, um, Data Wedge, most people are used to running Data Wedge in keystroke mode. So, in other words, when you scan a barcode, it'll act like somebody's typing on a keyboard and output those characters to wherever the cursor is. So, it kind of requires you to be in an input field. So, um, you know, what obviously what Darren was showing you was not that case, it was more programmatic control through through intents, okay? Um, so I just wanted to clear clear that up. And then as far as our official support for a plugin, I think Darren already covered that. Uh, we have a couple of examples that he, that he showed, uh, including his own, which is not officially supported, but can be used to, uh, to enhance and, and develop your own uh, plugin. So are there any other questions for Darren before we turn it over to Robin? Uh, let's see, Darren. Here's another one. Have you tried using Cordova with with a Bluetooth scanner like the RFD 8500? No, I've I've not tried that. Um, yeah. So I, if it has, uh, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to interface with that scanner. To be honest, I um, no, I, I haven't tried it. Is the honest answer. Yeah. Okay. Do you know if uh, Data Wedge supports that uh, scanner? I, I don't think so. Okay. But I can. And then uh, let's see, where can I access the slides? Yeah, so we'll be, uh, Jason, we'll include the slides um, in, um, in the event section for this uh, posting on, on developer.zebra.com. We'll include the recording as well as, um, as, well as the slides. You'll probably see that on um, on uh, Friday, the latest. Okay. Um, I don't, any other questions for Darren before we turn it over to Robin? Okay. All right, Darren. Well, if we have any other questions, just hang tight, uh, if you could, to the end. And if you can sure. pass the baton over to Robin. Done. All right. All right, Robin. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to uh, work with printers using Cordova. Um, just like with the uh, with the uh, Data Wedge scanner, um, we don't actually have anything official as far as support to Cordova at the moment. Um, there are a number of different ways to actually handle this. Um, there are a number of third-party Bluetooth and networking plugins out there that you could use to communicate with the printers. Um, 
but if you wanted to do things like sending an image uh, file to the printer or do some of our um, template handling, that becomes a little bit harder um, when you're um, trying to work with some of the third-party, more standardized uh, different plugins. So I'm going to show you here is actually how to use our LinkOS multi-platform SDK to create your own plugin. It'll be a custom plugin. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the steps you'll need to do to do that. Um, but certainly if you are just doing some basic communications, you can use some of those third-party plugins out there without having to actually go through this work. Um, and this is just to get you started. Uh, like I said, we don't actually have anything fully uh, officially supported at the moment. Um, I'm going to go on. So the, the main things are um, we're going to actually create our own custom plugin. Um, you modify some files, actually create some class files and JavaScript files, and then um, show you how to actually add the plugin to a project. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to create your, your plugin um, folder itself. You can use Plugman, um, or you can actually go in and just <laughs> create, those, uh, create those folders yourself and, and do some of that work in there. Um, there's some basic stuff. Uh, you need a plugin.xml a source, uh, code, uh, source, source folder and a www folder for the JavaScript files. Um, if you want to have Android and iOS, certainly you can be adding those in there. Um, for Android, um, you're also going to need a Gradle file in there. That's why we need Cordova 5.0 is the, the base in order to do this. Um, and because of the way that the LinkOS multi-platform SDK works, especially for Android, um, that's kind of necessary because of the extra um, files that um, the extra jar files that the um, SDK actually needs and, and uses underneath the covers. So once you actually have your um, folder structure set up, you're going to have to go into the plugin.xml file, um, and I'll pull that up here. Give me a sec. So this is an example of a plugin.xml that you could use. Um, or something that you get started with. And it shows basically there's some header information here as far as you know who owns it. Um, and then there's a couple of JS modules here. And these basically specify the JavaScript files that you want um, to create. And generally you're going to want to separate them out by specific um, activities or um, objects that you want to be creating and working with. Um, in this example, I've got a, a connection object and a discovery object. Um, and then uh, once you have those, uh, those modules added into there, um, we're going to add uh, platform-specific information. If you wanted iOS as well as Android, um, that would go in here as well under another platform. Um, but for Android, I'm um, going to want to create a couple of different um, object files that are going to be related to your JavaScript files. I like to have a one-to-one -one relationship just to make it really clear to me um, and to anyone who would be using it, uh, you know, what, uh, what files go with what. So uh, definitely I have a printer connection and a printer discovery just to go along with my connection and discovery JavaScript files there. Um, also, if you're going to be doing Bluetooth communications, there are a number of different um, uh, that are needed in Android to do that. Um, especially with some of the newer Android um, uh, APIs, uh, some of the ones that are a little bit more uh, interesting and uh, less uh, expected are uh, access course location in order to do Bluetooth discovery and Bluetooth privilege also to do Bluetooth discovery. Um, so that's basically in order to find Bluetooth printers and get a, a nice listing of them, um, you're going to need uh, those two permissions. In order to do any Bluetooth communication in general, you're going to need the uh, Bluetooth and Bluetooth admin as well. Um, so those ones have to be added to the manifest. Um, and then I put in my framework for the extras.gradle. This is all of my uh, jar files and the location of where they're supposed to be put um, in the install. Um, and then I add in here my source files, my two Java files that I'm creating, and the actual SDK jar file. Um, these two we're going to create um, in order to um, utilize the SDK itself and expose certain things to, uh, to the JavaScript so that you can um, util utilize those, uh, those activities. Um, 
in the extras.gradle, I've got a whole bunch of libraries in here. If you actually go in to the uh, ZebraLink OS SDK, you'll see all of these files in the uh, lib folder um, in the SDK. And that's because our um, the SDK Android.API actually uses a whole bunch of third-party libraries in order to help it along and uh, make sure that it's getting the most uh, accurate and, and best way of handling uh, communications and different functionality that it has in it. Um, so we want to actually make sure that those are all included in your project as well um, so that uh, you know the uh, API can actually work properly. So the next thing I want to show you is Actually, once you've you know handled the the XML file, then you're going to want to create a Java file, um, and this is basically we're going to pull in our SDK um, and the different objects and classes in there, and we're going to create uh, a new object here, the, the printer connection class, and it's going to extend the Cordova plugin, and we're going to also create an internal connection object. This is what I'm going to kind of use to handle all of the, you know, connection interactions and the actual um, with the actual SDK. So this is actually part of our um, LinkOS SDK objects. Um, got a couple of callbacks here just to make it a little easier to handle success and failure. Um, and then one of the things you need to do when you're creating a plugin for Cordova is to do an initialize function. And this is basically providing um, access to the uh, context and um, intents, I believe. Um, so the other thing that you actually have to override when you're creating uh, a plugin in the Java files is the execute function. Um, and with the execute function, this is where you handle all of the different activities that you want to have off of your main class uh, or object. So in here, I've got an initialized connection. And with the initialized connection, this is basically setting up and creating a new Bluetooth connection. Um, in this example, I've got it just doing a Bluetooth connection insecure. It could be a Bluetooth connection. It could be a network connection. It's just what I felt like doing in this particular one. Um, or we could have used the um, uh, connection factory in order to create a new connection based on whatever the string value was. Um, Information on how that works is all in the tech docs um, on the zebra .com, or on the tech docs zebra .com, and you can get access to the Java and iOS APIs in here. Um, so, say I want to do a Bluetooth connection. Um, there's some code in here, and I actually how to set that up. Um, in the actual folder there. So I'm using some of that basic stuff in order to uh, figure out how to create my connection object. Um, and you know, I'm just sending back a string that it says you don't have to do this every time. You can uh, leave it blank. But I figured um, it might be useful to show that the connection was created and, and other things were happening with it. Um, and then we go through and actually do all of the different functions that we might want to have access to within this class. So opening the connection, closing the connection, writing stuff to the connection. And I figure because the printer and we like to do a status checking, um, getting the status. So normally when you're doing printing um, with our SDK, you're going to open the connection, send data using the write, um, and then close the connection. Um, we also tend to prefer that um, when you open the connection that you check the printer status. So that would be what we would do it as far as a standard process for handling it. Um, so these are the main things that I'd want to do if I was just, you know, working with a standard connection. Um, so I put that in there. Um, so once you have these two override, overridden methods, the initialize and the execute in your Java file, then you can go and create a JavaScript file to actually match it. Um, and in this JavaScript file, you're, you know, basically what we've done here is we've created the printer connection object in the JavaScript as well. And we are um, creating prototype method, prototype functions in here to work with the Java file um, using the Cordova plugin um, execu execute functions. Um, so the way this works is um, 
we're creating an initializing function, which um, uses the initialize connection from our Java. So, add, you know, making sure that those two things match up. Um, and then we're giving it a printer address, um, which is um, in JSON format. And that is where we're pulling it from in this particular function here. So you can see that they really match up. Um, and then we've got a success and, and error callbacks in here as well, just to make it clear that um, you know, when they're, when they're um, doing the initialization that you know, they've gotten a success or an error um, out of that. And then we just override all the other ones um, with prototypes in the JavaScript. Um, and then the most important thing is uh, <laughs> creating or doing a module.exports um, in order to provide this JavaScript into the, um, the window for uh, the application that is being written with this particular uh, plugin. So let me go back to my slides here. So we've gone through that. We've gone through creating the extras.gradle. Um, and if you're doing an iOS, um, if you're doing both Android and iOS um, and other things, you're going to want to create new class files for each um, feature for, from each of the different um, each of the different platforms that you're working off of. And you're going to want to try and make sure that each of those classes exposes the same function functions in the same way, um, so that when you're creating your um, JavaScript file that they can call the same, you know, the same functions um, the same across all the different platforms that you're using. Um, but each time you're going to be overriding the execute functions um, and the initializing functions in order to create your, your classes on there. Um, and then with the JavaScript, um, the biggest thing is um, you're going to create the, you know, the different functions that you want to expose out um, to, to the other application. Uh, to the full application, and then um, ex make sure to export your object um, in the module.exports functionality down here. And then once you actually have a full plugin, um, there's a couple of different ways to install it. You can use Plugman again, um, especially if you created it with Plugin. Plugman, you can you know, use that to uh, install it into your application, um, or you can use Cordova directly. Um, in the particular example that I have there, um, this is how you you know, how you would use it um, uh, once it's installed, and or you know, if you were handing this out to somebody else, how, how they would use it. So um, something like printerconnection.init, and then you give your uh, success um, callback in here, which we're just doing. Um, we're going to alert and we're going to say we successfully did it. Or um, if there's an error, we're going to show that on the screen. And then we're given the address. This is the sort of Bluetooth MAC address of a printer. Um, and that should create a new connection object. Um, so I showed you techdocs.zebra.com. Um, and at least as far as showing you the different, um, different APIs that you can use to um, embed or create a new uh, plugin for, uh, for Cordova. So there's an iOS one in here as well. Um, uh, PC, which is a Java-based one, which you should be able to add that as well. Um, if you want to do BTLE support, we've got um, libraries in there as, as well that you can add to your, um, create a plugin for that. There are a number of third-party ones out there that you can use um, for doing basic communications over BTLE. I saw a few of them that uh, look pretty good. Um, but again, if you're trying to do things like convert images or work with templates and some of the other things that we really build into our SDK, then you probably actually want to go more down this route of utilizing the SDK to do those things. Um, again, we've got a, on the developer portal, developer.zebra.com, uh, there is a printer page on there as well um, that you can take a look at and ask us questions about stuff. Um, obviously, if there's uh, questions about this particular topic, you can also post it. Um, in fact, we're recommending that you post them on the uh, events page so that you can um, so you can uh, talk about this particular topic specifically. Um, the actual SDK is at zebra.com slash SDK. And um, most of the information that I've presented here is in the uh, 
Cordova Android plugin development guide um, on the Cordova page. Um, and that is primarily what I have here. So uh, let's uh, open it up for questions. Excellent, Robin. Right, Great Robin. job. Not, yeah, so if you have any questions for Robin or even at this point anybody at this time, uh, please type them into the question area. We do have a few, Robin. Uh, one uh, directly related to you. Um, how to print to a non-link OS printers like the uh, oops, like the 10, uh, 10 uh, I'm sorry, 105 SL Plus? Um, you can actually, we have an SDK that works with those older devices. Let me pull it up. Um, we actually do recommend using the Link OS SDK for, for all software development, even for non-Link OS printers. Um, and that yeah, is, but the support for that is, is actually reducing. They're focusing a little bit more on the Link OS side. We, we would prefer that, but um, I'm finding more and more that the, the support is, is not as good as, as it used to be as far as across older devices as well. And so there is a multi-platform SDK in here that is under the ZebraLink environment. Um, and that one is not something that we update very often, um, but it does have the um, compatibility for some of our older non-Link OS printers. Um, and uh, it should be useful for you who are um, doing development on some of the older printers and are running into issues with the Link OS SDK. Okay. And um, next question. Uh, I'm sorry, Robin, were you finished with that one? Yes. Okay. Uh, so next question really, I guess, could be for both of you guys. Darren, I don't know if you're still on. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So this was uh, regarding... You know, if you if you have a web app, right? The the whole comparison of when do I use Cordova as opposed to enterprise browser, right? Uh, what's kind of the when would I use one over the other, basically? Hmm. My my statement on that one is if your primary intent is to work with Zebra devices, um, then enterprise browser has has everything built out for you, and we are fully supporting, you know, how that works and how it's handled and um, what what you can do with it um, as far as, you know, working with Zebra on that. If you intend to go across non-Zebra devices, um, then your options are more open, but Enterprise Browser becomes less as much of an option for you. Okay, but Darren, you have any That's my there. focus on that. Yeah, I'd... I'd I'd say enterprise browser. The clues in the name. It, it's just a browser, and the the comparison is between. The, the, it's the same as Cordova versus a mobile application. In Cordova, you're creating an app. It's installable. You can brand it with a, a, a mobile app. You have this issue with discoverability. Uh, you can only, I mean, you can run apps in different tabs. In fact, that is another limitation of enterprise browser. You can only have a single instance of the app running at any one time. So, uh, if you're if you're familiar with like the the difference between mobile apps and Cordova, it, it's the same argument essentially. It's all enterprise browser brings in addition to mobile apps is the ability to access Zebra hardware, like uh, like Robin was saying. Okay, so yeah, I think that both of you guys answered that question. Carmen, if you have any more comments or questions on that, please let us know. And maybe uh, Carmen will include some of this in the uh, in the next Enterprise Browser presentation that's coming up in a few weeks. So, all right, cool deal. Um, anybody else have any other questions, comments? Um, and by the way, just a reminder, we'd, we'd love to hear some, some comments and feedback on the upcoming app forms for next year. If, if there's any particular presentations, topics, um, things you'd like to see. We're kind of, um, you know, building the the um, the workshops and the, and the content now. So, um, all right. Well, uh, give another minute or so uh, while we're doing that. I just want to thank uh, Darren and Robin for presenting today. Uh, really appreciate the uh, information. It was very useful. Getting some feedback, and actually before. We got some feedback, Darren, from somebody else that actually used what you did in the blog and, and implemented successfully uh, regarding data wedge in Cordova. So appreciate the information. 
All right, I don't see any other questions, so thanks for joining today, and we hope to see you next time at the next uh, Dev Talk. Uh, yep. So we will send out, I'll send out a link. I also, by the way, just sent out the link in the questions. So the link to this event on uh, the developer portal um, is, in, is in the question area. We'll use that same link to post the slides, the recording, and then use that same link to collect any feedback regarding this presentation. So, all right, cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, thanks again, Robin and Darren.